Hello, and welcome to the Tech Theater Skills series. My name is Chris Schlemp. I've been an actor, director, projections designer, and theater teacher for over 20 years. And I'm glad to be sharing some of my knowledge with you. This series is on lighting design, and it's geared for someone who is just beginning their adventures of discovery in terms of lighting in the theater. The series is going to be broken down into seven parts. And this is episode six, Some Electricity Basics. There's some pretty hefty vocabulary coming your way right about now, including some more in-depth explanation. So I recommend you get out a pen and paper. If you start making that connection between your brain, your eye, and your hand, you're more likely to learn. We know that lighting instruments are what cast light onto the stage, and we also know that they do that because they have lamps inside them. But what is it that causes the lamps to turn on in the first place? It's what we call electricity, and we all use it every day and all the time, but today we are going to take a closer look at what electricity is and what we need to know about it to do our lighting work in the theater. Basically, electricity is the movement of electrons through a medium. And this movement can be used to do work, such as moving a motor or turning on a lamp. All matter is made up of atoms, which have a nucleus and electrons. In some materials, or media, these electrons are really stable, which means they don't move very much, if at all. In other media, the electrons are free to move about and get pushed in a certain direction when a force gets applied to them. Materials that allow electrons to move freely such as the copper in electric wire, are called conductors. Materials that prohibit electrons from moving, such as the plastic around the copper wire, are called insulators. To put it simply, we get the electrons to our lamps with copper wire, and we prevent those electrons from going somewhere else, such as in our bodies, which would electrocute us, by shielding that wire in a plastic sleeve. Here is a drawing of a really simple electrical circuit. On the left side, we have a source of power, such as a battery, which has some chemicals inside of it that are going to provide the electrons the push they need. Because electrons have a negative charge, that means they will always be moving in the same direction as they get repulsed along their wire path. If there's nothing in the way, they simply complete the circuit and return to the battery, ready to do another lap. If they meet something along the way, like a motor or a lamp, they power that device as they move through it and then head back to the battery. If something breaks the path, like a switch, then the electrons are stuck where they are until the path is completed again. A switch breaks and completes a circuit between the power source and the device. In order to go any deeper with electricity, we have to learn some terms and also meet some famous international scientists. The first one is how we refer to electromotive force, the pushing force that moves the electrons. This force is measured in volts, which are named after the Italian scientist Alessandro Volta. The second one is how we refer to the intensity of the electrical current, which you might think of as the current's speed. This intensity is measured in amperes, or amps for short, which are named after the French scientist André-Marie Ampère. The third one is resistance, which describes how freely the electrons are allowed to move. Resistance is measured in ohms, which are named after the German scientist Georg Ohm. And finally, we need a way to refer to the work that these electrons actually accomplish. We measure this power in watts, and they are named after the Scottish scientist James Watt, who also invented the steam engine and started the Industrial Revolution. Just as we saw with Auguste Fresnel and his famous lens, if you discover or invent something really cool, you might just have your name attached to it forever. Okay, that might have been an intimidating set of vocabulary. Let's break down each one using an analogy that you can more easily wrap your brain around, such as water in a hose. The electromotive force is like the pressure on the water line. Even if you don't turn on the faucet, the water is there, right? Just waiting to gush out. That pressure or potential energy is like the volts in a battery or that are waiting for you at your outlet. As soon as you plug in, like turning on the faucet, the electrons come rushing out. The intensity of the current is like the speed at which the water comes out the hose. Do we have many gallons per minute or just a few? Greater intensity means a faster rate. That speed is the number of amps on an electrical circuit. Resistance is like when you put your thumb on the edge of the hose. What happens to the water? Less comes out, right? 
and it sprays all over? Or what happens when you kink the hose? You stop it completely, right? Or what about a smaller tube like a straw compared to a bigger tube like a fire hose? That's resistance too. Bigger hose equals less resistance, smaller hose equals more. We can have that with electricity too. A thicker copper wire can carry more electricity at once than a smaller wire can. We measure that resistance in ohms. And finally, we have power, which is like when we use the water to do some tasks, such as spinning a water wheel. The amount of work it can do is what we measure in watts. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below, or if you happen to be in my class, drop them in the chat. Let's see if we can figure out the answer together. You knew it was coming. Time for some math. Don't be scared. The calculations are pretty straightforward. The power equation is P equals IE. If you think of a slice of pie, it's easy to remember. Power equals intensity times electromotive force. Or to put it another way, power equals speed of current times the pressure behind it. Personally, I find it easier to remember the formula using the names of the units of measurement. People sometimes call this the West Virginia equation because it goes W equals VA. Watts equals volts times amps. Just remember that V is actually E and A is actually I. The math is the same, but it's easy to get them mixed up. And because of how math works, if you know any two of the units, you can easily figure out the third. Watts equals volts times amps. Amps equals watts divided by volts. Volts equals watts divided by amps. If you know watts and volts, you can figure out the amps. If you know amps and watts, you can figure out the volts. You just have to do the math. The next one is very similar, but I will not explore it in greater detail because, to be honest, for our work in the theater, it simply does not come up as often. But we should still know it so that if the need arises, it's there. This one is called Ohm's Law, and it goes like this. E equals I R. Electromotive force equals intensity times resistance, or to use the units, volts equals amps times ohms. Again, you can figure out the other two versions of the formula on your own once you know the main one. Pause the video if you need to. One way that resistance actually does pop up for us is when we have to decide what kind of cable or extension cord to use. We have to be aware that extension cords have a gauge, which is basically the thickness of the copper in the wire. This operates a lot like the fire hose in the earlier analogy. A fire hose can handle a more intense current because it is larger. There is more room for the water to flow. If you tried to attach a garden hose to a fire hydrant, the hose would burst. In the same way, if you send a too intense current through a cable that can't handle it, it will melt or worse. Wire has a gauge number. You can see it on the packaging for these extension cords. The lower the gauge, the more intense current it can handle. Lighting instruments usually need way more power than a typical appliance, and so they need to have thicker, lower gauge cable running from the outlet, or the dimmer, to the lamp. Okay, let's have a little fun with some practical uses for all this knowledge. Oh, and one quick note, if you can't tell from my accent, I work and teach in the United States, so I will be talking about how our outlets and power setups look here in the US. Yours will probably look quite a bit different if you live in another country. In image number one, we have a standard outlet. Waiting just inside the wall is 120 volts of electrical goodness ready to power your devices. If it is a typical room outlet, then it is on a 15 amp circuit. Often all the outlets in a room or even in several rooms will all be on one circuit. So you can turn on up to a certain amount of watts before the circuit breaks and all the outlets shut down. Have you ever had the experience of a bunch of people in your home getting ready at the same time and all blow drying their hair and then the power shuts off in those rooms? That's why. The circuit has broken because too much power was drawn at once. When that happens, you have to go out to the electrical panel, image number five, to reset the breaker. How much load can be on a 120 volt 15 amp circuit? You tell me. Do the math. Volts times amps. 120 times 15. 1800, right? Some hair dryers need 750 watts. 750 times 3 is 2250. That's why your morning routine got shut down. Image number two is what an outlet on a 20 amp circuit looks like. You can tell by the extra line it has on the left hand opening, which can fit a special plug for devices that absolutely must be on a 20 amp circuit. 
In image number three, we see an upside down outlet. You know what that means? That's a special way to tell people that this outlet is controlled by a switch somewhere, such as a light switch that is meant to turn on a lamp in the room. Image number four is of an electrical meter, which is keeping a running total of how many kilowatts your home has racked up. A kilowatt is simply a thousand watts. That's how the electric company knows how much to charge you. Finally, we have the electrical panel, which distributes the service coming into your house, typically 200 amps, to all the different circuits. Most of them will be 15 amp circuits, but some will be 20, 30, 40, or even 50 for some of the bigger appliances. Time for you to try it out. Let's imagine that you're working on the lighting crew for a play, and your technical director tells you that they want you to attach a strip light, the image with the large square colored gels, to a circuit that already has three Fresnels and two Parkans. You know your TD is really busy and might have forgotten to double check the load on this circuit, so you do some quick math to see whether or not you should plug in the strip light. You know the strip light needs 1000 watts in order to work. You know that each Fresnel is drawing 250 watts. You know the Parkans are each drawing 500 watts. You know that there are 120 volts at the outlet and the circuit is rated at 20 amps. Should you add the strip light? Pause the video and figure it out. All right, let's check our answer. 120 times 20 equals 2400. This circuit can only provide up to 2400 watts of power. 500 times 2 is 1000. 250 times 3 is 750. That means there is only 650 watts left, which is not enough for our 1000 watt strip light. You respectfully point this out to your TD and earn everyone's admiration for thinking on your feet and putting your knowledge to work. Well done. You learned a lot today. You learned about how electricity works. You gained some familiarity with two of the fundamental equations of electricity, and you discovered some practical applications for your new knowledge, both at home and in the theater. Thanks for stopping by. Come back real soon for the next lesson in the series. And if you felt like you got something out of today's lesson, then please like and subscribe. See you next time.